Get this show on the road. Well, welcome everyone to the Singularity Net Decentralized OS uh, series with a specific focus on decentralized finance. We are very fortunate today to have Joel Dietz, uh, as OG as they come in the crypto space. He's a serial entrepreneur, he's an intellectual historian, he's been involved in several key initiatives. And one of the most well-known is MetaMask, which if you're watching this, you know what it is. So you can thank Joel for that. Or I guess if you really don't like it, you, I suppose you could curse Joel. But we appreciate what he did for the space um, in that respect. But he's, he's gone much be more beyond that. We're going to touch on all of those things. He, his research these days focuses on the confluence of blockchain network topologies and swarm intelligence. So we'll talk a little bit about his current projects and especially how those principles undergirding decentralized organizations can be used to fuel global innovation, which is something we obviously sorely need. He also works on something called Holonic philosophy, which I don't know what it is, but we're also gonna find out what that is. The evolution of jurisprudence, data-driven approaches to innovation and smart city data architecture. I don't know when he finds time to sleep, but he seems to be doing a lot of really fascinating things. So, Joel, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for taking the time, sir. It's a pleasure Excellent. to be here. Well, I wanted to so. just start off with a little bit. We always like to get to know our, our guests. So, Joel, maybe you could just give us a little bit. When did you first discover Bitcoin? When did you first discover Ethereum? And, and what was it that lit you up about that experience? Um. I guess I've been reading, you know, alternative economic literature for a long time, as well as mainstream. Uh, I basically read Hacker News every day for as long as Hacker News has existed. So, you know, I read about Bitcoin back 2010. I was not initially convinced that it would be anything of significance. Um, and even back then, it was pretty obvious that it was like kind of a little bit polarizing. You know, people either loved it or hated it. And, you know, some people were very put off by the energy intensity. I actually was a bit of a skeptic back then. Um, and I was annoyed because I was reading Hacker News all the time. And um, all these Bitcoin, you know, threads would pop up. And I actually wrote a filter. It's still on <laughs> GitHub um, for Hacker News that sorted things based on what you wanted to see. Because I was into Lisp languages at the time. So I was like, I would much rather see Lisp related posts highlighted in Hacker News and, you know, people who are cryptocurrency punks or whatever, not always right at the top of the thing and all the controversies right. about it. So um, ironically, my first contribution to cryptocurrency was actually a, a filter that filtered out some aspects of cryptocurrency. I mean, it was customizable, so you could set it however you want. Um, but then I was working very heavily on other types of digital currency with actual communities that were kind of off-grid communities that wanted to you know, build resilient futures for themselves. And that was really tough. And among other things, because regulators didn't allow you to innovate in the financial sector. Like everything you wanted to do required like a million euro license. I was in Europe at the time, you know, in between Germany and Italy. And, you know, there's nothing you could do if you have a startup, you can't like, you know, send, you know, this would be at this time, it would be a way or something like that, but across one board to the next without getting a whole series of permissions in place and from people who had no clue what they were right. enabling. So after I went back and studied the history of digital currencies and what had happened, you know, prior to Bitcoin and DigiCash and, you know, some of the many other things that predate Bitcoin, I was like, this is pretty much the only way you could do it. And I had an extreme appreciation, um, especially seeing that, you know, some of the people like David Chom or whatever else came out with, you know, the same kind of like battle wounds from their first digital currency attempt that, um, you know, I had. So, because I put like my whole life savings into my, you know, uh, own digital currency, eco currency, so it's even like, designed to be sustainable and have all this, you know, you know, both feel good, but also very practical impact. And it was basically a failure. So, um, 
despite meeting a lot of interesting people. That's that's pretty funny. You, you almost came at it from it almost gives that skeptical. You know, that's a common experience for people in crypto. A lot of people, the first time they hear about it, they're like, what the hell is this? It's never going to work. And then it sounds like you hit a practical use case that was really it's a DeFi use case. It's this simple issue of how do I have, you know, international transfers. And if anyone's ever sent a wire transfer, uh, they know the pain and the cost and the and the hassle associated with that. So that's that's really fascinating. So what was it then sort of take us through that next step in the journey once you started to sort of feel that um, the potential? Where did you go from maybe skeptic to you know, full on believer? Take us through that story, if you will. So, you know, I was still actively following cryptocurrency related news and Bitcoin magazine. And I really liked Vitalik's essays in Bitcoin magazine. They were very complete and treatments of every subject. So I was following him as a writer and I, I kind of wanted to meet him or figure out something, kind of what he was working on, because it, it just seemed kind of cutting edge. And, you know, I've always been a technology enthusiast and like being at the edge of, you know, technological development. And then when the Ethereum white paper dropped, I was like, um, I had what I call a nerdgasm. And I think I may have invented that word, but it's just just completely mind blown. And like, oh, this is going to change so many different things. I just started writing down all the different things that smart contracts could potentially do. Um, and, you know, as someone who has studied a bit of organizational design before and, you know, knows a little bit about the history of joint stock companies and, you know, stock markets and how equity things work, I was like, all these things can basically be programmed from scratch to be better than they are today. Besides the fact that you're just going to enable um, an immense amount of um, innovation, you know, around other things because the uh, I mean, one thing that was clear to me already is this nature of kind of open networks, you know, and that basically if you have open networks, then, you know, you can have anyone show up and innovate any time. And that's just super exciting. It basically, you know, it's kind of when people say that Bitcoin is the Internet of money or whatever else, I think it's very, very on point because, you know, what websites allow is anyone to just show up and start creating and creating their version of art or thoughts or whatever else without anyone saying whether or not they were allowed to do it. And, and you know, in my mind, that's the most exciting, colorful thing of the Ethereum world to this day is that basically it's a network for open innovation. So um, let me let me double click on that a little bit, because, you know, when new tech not first of all i love the term nerdgasm is that open source do you mind if i use that again okay yeah please i like kind of feel like it should go on urban dictionary at some point or I, I think i mean i, I can certainly remember my journey down the rabbit hole where that moment where i sat up on my couch and i was like oh shit, this is a tsunami 50 miles off the coast and no one sees it's coming uh but I didn't realize I was having a nerdgasm at the moment. So thank you for giving me the, the name on that one. So, and I've had multiple, there are the days with the multiple nerdgasms, but we'll, we'll leave that for another conversation. Um, you know, some people are younger than others, but let me double click on that because when, whenever a new innovation comes on the scene, there's sort of two approaches, right? The first approach, and, and tell me if you disagree with this premise, but the first approach is, hey, we can use this technology to do things we already do better, faster, cheaper. And that's like, you know, enterprise DLT or whether it's just, you know, email is faster mail going back 20 years. But then there's, and that's fine and that's great and we should do all that. But the really cool stuff is the stuff that was previously impossible. And that's where I think it sounds like some of the things that really got you excited. So help us think, I mean, you, you, you have a tremendous background with economics and, and, and open networks, and I know you have a passion for sustainability and, and, and collective intelligence. So when did you start sort of formulating your theories about what's possible now, now that these decentralized networks and Ethereum was really, you know, captured so many imaginations, when did you start seeing, wait a second, there are things that we, that there are massive global problems that can be addressed in entirely new ways when did you start to realize that? And when did you start to formulate your theories about what was possible? I mean, take us through that story and, and how you're thinking about it these days. That's a lot, but you can handle it. Well, I mean, in some ways it even predates Ethereum and, you know, the first currency project that I started 
um, was called greens and it basically was an eco currency where every time you deposited money part of the base of that it was in some ways the first stable coin and at least conceptually um, was held in land-backed assets and we had a partnership with the world land trust so basically they would secure land in ecuador or other kind of rainforest put it in a trust and then basically hold on to it as a sort of preserve um, which i thought you know conceptually like you know i guess maybe it's my technology temperament but i don't have the necessarily trust in global governance as it currently exists to solve some of the largest um, problems mm -hmm. that this planet has at this moment um, so uh, and I think that's shared by many people. You're not alone, Joel. <laughs> and so I was, <laughs> so I, I was just thinking, well, you know, maybe this type of technology can be used for it if we can get enough kind of people and traction behind it, and you know, actually take it and you know, use it to solve some of these issues. So I mean, that was like 2011. So it was you know way beyond you know and. I, was talking with Wire Magazine this week about sustainability stuff, and you know, it's it's always been an issue, as anyone in the Bitcoin space knows, regarding the energy efficiency of, of Bitcoin. But um, you know, I mean, it's equally topical today, and I think just beyond that, once you get into DAOs, I mean, the first group I started, I mean, I started the Ethereum Silicon Valley groups, um, and. Um, that was, you know, we were talking about everything, but then we created a second spin-off group called Decentralized Autonomous Society that was basically focused on all the governance related applications of, you know, this sector of technology. But since most of us were Ethereum people, it kind of was leaning an Ethereum thing, although we had Dash people show up and we had, you know, various other groups um, come through. And, you know, the, the, the sky was the limit. I mean, once you start applying DAOs at scale, and, you know, at that time there were like right. three DAOs that really existed, you know, or something like that. So it was, it was very early. But, yeah, once you start applying it at scale to certain types of problems, I mean, at some level, it, it almost feels right. like there's no problem right. you couldn't solve. Um, and, you know, I mean... It does partially depend on the accessibility, but at some level, if you think about, and I say this, and this is kind of a controversial thing to say to some people, uh, but maybe not within this audience, but if you think of like governance as, you know, a stack, you know, of software, which I often do, that comes, it kind of comes pre-installed on your computer, you know, it's kind of like the internet explorer of your mm -hmm. country, so to speak. And you get all these functions, but then it also these days at least comes with a lot of spyware. You know, there's a lot of people who've like figured out their way of like adding their own version of things that siphons off, you know, this, that, and the other. And so it becomes increasingly painful to use for whatever its original intended purpose was. So, uh, and for me, yeah, the pain is is real, and I'm sure a lot of other people, you know, feel that, especially with the Fed basically printing, you know, trillions of dollars and inflating M1 and all that right now. Anyone, a right. US person or anyone else who's kind of dependent on that currency system. So, um, yeah, so it is a concern. And it's been, you know, a real issue for a while. I mean, from a historical perspective, go historical stuff again, it's kind of why the Fed was created in the first place <laughs> because of, you know, financial crises that weren't managed. Um, and J.P. Morgan like stepped in himself and basically bailed out the U.S. government and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, you're something better than me doing this. Um, but, you know, the system we have isn't perfect. And now it has, you know, its own de deficiencies that are kind of being revealed. So anyways, I try to send the positive side and as a software thing, even if I like, you know, don't like Internet Explorer with a bunch of spyware installed in it, you know, it's still sometimes better than not having a web browser at all. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you couldn't build something that's better um, and, you know, delivers the same public goods, you know, resources, issues, you know, kind of things without all of that. So, yeah, I mean, so. there are so many different directions to go on this one. I, I, I saw a stat the other day that something like 35 percent of all dollars ever created have been created since last March. I mean, it's just mind blowing. You look at that M1 chart and it's like the gradually, 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 then suddenly nightmare scenario for money printing. Um, but I want to go into the DAO space because I think that's, you know, really where 
Um, there's so much potential because this, like you said, this govern this DAO is at scale and, and no problems you can't solve. So let's let's go take that and start taking those concepts of decentralized governance, decentralized autonomous societies and organizations, and help us see your vision of the future for when it comes to you know swarm intelligence, collective intelligence. We could talk about finance. I mean, we could talk about a bunch of things or sustainability. Like you said, there's no problem that can't be solved, but for a lot of people, even those who are passionate about the space, they might believe in it, but the, the concrete steps are some of the challenges that we're going to face along the way, especially as it relates to governance and getting all these people uh, aligned. You know, how, how do you see, what do you see as some of the likely evolutionary paths for that as we start to, you know, DAOs hit the mainstream, if you will? Um, well, I think, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I follow biology, and biology basically thinks that this, you know, global governance, you know, stack is going to implode on itself, and that you know, it's going to be free form, kind of like snow crash, where everyone goes up and like creates their own micro society and tries to like hold the fort on their own. And if that is the case, then basically, you know, Bitcoin billionaires are going to need to start buying security companies and start, you know, really like investing in the future of that more like hardened you know, deep Citadel is real. Um, infrastructure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and that that could be the future. Um, I certainly wouldn't discount it as a possibility uh, right now. Um, and if it is, you know, then there's a lot of things, you know, that we just got to take for granted. I hate to say, I mean, as far as like the supply chain management and, you know, our own security in most kind of developed countries and things like that. And so you step away, like, I was in Tulum before I was in Dubai, and I realized, oh, there's certain things I just can't take for granted here that I'm used to taking for granted um, when I was in the U.S. So where does that leave us? I mean, uh, it's a little bit speculative. I think one thing we definitely need, and this goes back to your question about swarm intelligence and kind of why I was originally so excited about this topic, is that we have the ability with blockchains as a tool to do economic modeling that is far more advanced than anyone has done in history. And it also goes into the smart city data architecture kind of world. Because we literally can pick out, if we're, especially if we're starting new from new society, and again, you know, this is kind of like biology talks about this all the time. Um, but if you have a, a new city that you're building from scratch, you can pick out the success factors. What is it? Are you maximizing GDP? Are you maximizing for health factors? You know, how are you measuring? Are you measuring for the happiness of people? And you know, potentially you can capture all that data reasonably easy today. And you can say, okay, we're going out with this very specific objective to you know maximize these variables. This is how we're tracking it. This is our kind of you know goal of doing it. And then that can very easily, you know, rapidly iterate on itself and, you know, outcompete other structures or produce IP that, you know, bigger institutional kind of countries, et cetera, can use. I mean, just on a COVID thing, which is obviously very topical, like the, the Dubai where I am and, you know, kind of working a little bit with the government of Dubai here to, you know, capture some of the data, but this, but they have very granular data on, the beaches and where every COVID case happens. And so whenever there is an issue, they can easily say, okay, this beach area is where the new COVID cases are doing. We need to, you know, decrease to closing times from one back to 11 PM and, you know, send some people over to more strictly enforce the distancing things between tables and, you know, all this stuff. So you can basically do these kind of what I'm calling dynamic equilibrium model, kind of regional breakdown and, you know, stuff like that that is um, I don't know, more sophisticated. It's, it's a more um, fast response to evolving conditions kind of model than, you know, let's wait and see how much it spikes and then get right, paranoid right. and then close everything, you know, sort of thing. Um, and then wait until the numbers seem it's good. It's like a brute force everything. attack on the and pandemic. It's just, Yeah, I mean, whatever. These th th there's obviously a lot of people, but I think it's partially right. they're not trained to think about data. They don't really know what data they have. No one has really set it up the infrastructure to deliver that data, and so you know the response ends up being kind of delayed response, and then 
you know, without the granular level specificity that would be more helpful. And then, you know, obviously with that, you can do things like mm. keep gyms and other things that are conducive to health and mental well health as well. Right. Being okay. able to zoom in and zoom yeah. out. Let me ask. So yeah. if we can at the end, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, but, I apologize. Mm. No, no, I'm just saying that goes into the whole swarm intelligence thing. I mean, I don't think anyone's really doing this right now, but I know people who can and I'm putting the groundwork into place to do this, but really breaking down, you know, all society into kind of user agents and the different types of people and their interactions and capturing the data so that really when you're building something from scratch, you can you can basically dynamically simulate an entire, you know, smart city and say, okay, if we take this mix of demographics and these people together and this kind of thing, you know, what is the net result going to look like? Um, and, you know, to the extent to which we can do that, we can I don't know, do really, really cool things. So, and, and blockchain is just an amazing tool because it's like open source data. The data is just all sitting there. It's like a Petri dish for doing, you know, economic innovation. So, I, and I, I think, you know, I'm hoping that some societies that are, you know, otherwise going to be left behind, to be perfectly frank, are going to like wise up and say, you know, let's put some resources, you know, money, et cetera, you know, academics kind of towards these type of topics so that we can figure out the best. Yeah, way to that's, I mean, kind of I want to put a pin in the Tulum conversation because that's an area of interest, the, the Tulum lifestyle, shall we call it. So maybe at the end we can come back to that. But um I mean, you said a lot of really interesting things there. The, the thing that, that, I mean, I agree with you that blockchain is like this beautiful tabula rasa for crypto ec or economic design and game theoretic and mechanism design and all that kind of stuff. But what I'm, what I'm almost hearing you say is that because we have this space where we can rapidly innovate and we can rapidly test and model, it's almost like you could design a token economic system and then run it through some sort of AI, you know, singularity net, of course, uh, led a simulator to sort of see, well, how would this play out if we had combined it with the data from a city? And then I'm almost hearing you say, and, and tell me if I'm going down the wrong path here, I'm almost hearing you say like some of these places that to your point might be left behind could say, wait a second, let's run some simulations, let's figure out a new economic model. And they could experiment with 10, 15, 100 different mini economic city states to see which one thrives using the data and keeping it all decentralized to preserve privacy, but basically leapfrog from the centralized fiat system into sort of a decentralized economic system. Am I on the right track here or am I just making stuff up? Yeah, I mean, 100%. And you could say like, you know, the UK as an example, like set up, you know, a hundred little microeconomic zones, you know, within there and the, you know, let's say thousand right. to five thousand person range, allow people to kind of pick the preconditions, you know, track the data behind it. And, you know, it'd be obviously be more experimental, not everything not not every experiment's gonna succeed, so you have to be prepared for that. But the one thing that is amazing about um, this type of stuff too, and since you brought in the AI and circularity net, I think it would be super helpful, is that there's an interesting discovery mechanism in humans' relationship with AI, where AI is discovering all these sort of better patterns of behavior that humans have neglected because you know we are educated right. by people who came before us and they or put some patterns in our yeah. thinking and whatever else. So every time you every time you play chess, you know, there's like certain standard openings that you're highly likely to do because you've seen them and you know they work and whatever else and it's risky to try anything else. Whereas for the AI that can cycle through all the different permutations and, you know, backtrack whatever else, there's no risk involved, you know, um, for, for trying those things. And as well, they can see all the kind of observable possibilities and kind of iterate through them. So it's, it's really, really interesting to see, you know, what they might discover, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Christopher Alexander yeah, and pattern it language. Sounds interesting. Go. <laughs> this, this, this one community I'm working with now in Bali, that's a, you know, 300 villa complex um, called Park that is, you know, a, a digital nomad hub, let's say. And I'm actually hoping to bring the brand global and, you know, working in various partnerships with them. Um, and uh, one of the founders was heavily influenced by this guy, Christopher 
um, Alexander, who was an architect, but he kind of wrote, it's probably like a philosophical fashion, but it's like, what is the right number of windows per, you know, square foot? You know, what is the kind of proportions that these things need to be in, you know, to have the like mm. optimal flow, so to speak? It's almost like if you were to take, you know, a math guy and try and systematize some sort of like Qigong maximize, or optimize for figure flow out, state, but kind of at one? like a vil- yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very similar to what happened in that stuff. But like, you know, then you know, how much you know greenery does there need to be? How tall should things be? How large should the common areas be? Like all this stuff. I mean, you can look. He, he has, gives very specific guidelines for all of these different categories of things based on his experience. And he's he's also interesting in that he's kind of designing at like a village level, let's say. So it's not just about a single unit and, you know, what the person side, but how does the whole kind of community come together? And those type of dynamics are very interesting, you know, in the sense that, and and his work is very thought provoking in that sense, because it start, you start thinking right. about all these things that you never thought about before, you know? And you might not agree with them, and it's actually very difficult to know what the data would be to really have a definitive judgment about many of the topics topics he writes about. But I can easily imagine someone setting in a kind of, let's say, meta language for architectural design that has various patterns and geometries and whatever else embedded in it. You know, going in, I mean, biology looks like VR, so let's say in VR you design this, like, city, you know, thing, people, like, populate the homes, and it goes out to, like, you know, some AI building things go out and, like, build all these different structures and stuff like that. And then you get all this interesting data on, like, did this work? Like, does it, does the mobile, you know, like, what if you can move your house, which you actually literally do this now, and I know people have done this as well. You know, you put the house on some kind of struts or wheels or whatever else or some portion of bedrooms. And what if you gave the people permission to, like, move their unit every, you know, 10 days or something like that, you know? So then, like, the whole structure of your digital nomad hub is, like, a dynamic readjusting, you know, thing. And people are kind of moving to different clusters. It's like swarm intelligence sitting on top of a physical world and the physical world responding. And you can... Or self-organize with the people in your neighborhoods that are, you know, if you're in the artistic mode today and then a month later, you're like, you know what? I want to nerd out with the, with the hardcore geeks. You can sort of move around and go to different parts of the city, as it were. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, like, oh, I want to get in the maker space and start doing some welding or, you know, let's do like a welding, you know, a couple weeks and. You know, then I'm back by the library zone or whatever, you know, so these are all kind of interesting possibilities. I don't think they're all going to be built, you know, overnight, but I think if we give people the freedom to do them, then people are going to innovate and, you know, create amazing new worlds that are going to be, you know, the patterns for future society. And the larger societies, you know, as they make space for them are going to be the ones that thrive and evolve and, you know, uh, become... I'm, the future, basically. I'm, 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 I'm as you're talking, I mean, my mind's kind of exploding here. I guess I'm having a nerdgasm, right? Uh, it's sort of you having that. It's almost like you model. You know, there are going to be tools to help you model crypto economic systems, and then there'll be AIs that it sounds like you're talking. I thought I was coming up with this idea of like AIs don't suffer from heuristic debt. You know, they're they're not. They're not caught up in that. And then you could take that Mm -hmm. and deploy that into VR simulators for people to actually get, you could get the real data of how people behave. And then the ones that are most successful, then you could deploy potentially in the physical world and you could run 10 million experiments or whatever all at once globally. And you give people a chance and then you bring in that, that tech nature stuff that you were taught with the architect sort of framework. And you say, oh, if you're doing this in sub-Saharan Africa, here are the five, you know, WordPress, you know, templates that you want to deploy kind of thing versus the Arctic or whatever and optimize for creativity and innovation. But I might be getting ahead of myself here. Yeah, and I think that heuristic also open is open source. Great so there you go. And, you know, it colors so much of what, oh, <laughs> it colors so much of what we think about as governance, right? Whenever you go with governance, a lot of times go, oh, you know, are you, and you're like, no, it's really, you know, <laughs> dynamic decision-making, you know, methods that, you know, 
are tiered to every process, you know, leads to some kind of result, leads to some capital allocation, leads right. to something getting built or not getting built, you know? And so once you like br break down the whole chain, you know, there's so many different ways to optimize for, you know, results that are positive. Yeah. To, okay. This is the part of the show, things. Joel, where you need to change your background. You got to keep it, you know, keep it fresh for people so that you, you show them how you can show up. Whatever you, whatever you're feeling today, man. You want to just, you want to, I mean, if, I mean, in some pirates, respects, you know there are people who still view this world as full of pirates, and that's the only thing it's good for. So, if you if you're feeling piratey and a little bit uh, rebellious, that's good. Um, whatever, whatever, you, yeah, whatever works for you. We're 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 we're, uh, we're equal opportunity filters. There we go. That's that's working for me. Um, so speak it. So now that you get the pirate. Uh, had on. Why don't you talk a little bit about the evolution of jurisprudence? Because pirates and jurisprudence naturally go together. So help us sort of understand what your what your thoughts are. That like you know, I mean, we've seen some really interesting experiments in this space. The one that comes to mind for me is the Aragon Court and the Aragon Network jurisdiction and their efforts, which may or may not have worked, depending on whatever. But it was a really interesting idea to decentralize juries, essentially. So. What are some of the, the research, what are some of the thoughts that you have around that and, and how that plays into some of the things we've been talking about? Um, you know, I've done a lot of, I've had actually been involved in a fair number of like Dow fallouts already. Dow insurance, um, that's going to be a whole thing. And uh, I don't actually know if I've been, a, yeah, I know, yeah. Because you're like, one of the things you appreciate in retrospect, you know, about the legal system right. is usually you're like, oh, I want to build a whole new future and I don't need all those <laughs> pesky, you know, laws and lawyers and everything. And then, you know, once you get in a while, you're like, oh, well, you know, one of the things that legal systems do really well is cover edge cases because they've just been evolving, you know, as you might call it bloat, but a big part of the bloat is like figuring out what to do if someone like trips, falls down on their face goes to the hospital and then becomes, you know, incapacitated as they were about to sign the contract, you know? And they're like, oh, well, how do, what do we do now? He's right. about to sign the contract, but now he can't sign, whatever, you know? So anyways, I, I don't have the legal training to answer that specific question, but I know that, you know, lots of people around the world know the answer to that question um, in various jurisdictions. And uh, it also makes it a challenging, you know, arena to innovate in if you're trying to create some something from scratch. Um, and, you know, since you bring up, I mean, pirates is so interesting because there's a really big gap between how pirates are remembered and treated in popular media and then how they actually evolve. And Educate me. You know? I'm listening. Um, so, so, so a couple of different things. But one is that, you know, most of the pirates were originally working for the queen or some government, you know, and the reason they became pirates is because they signed a treaty so that they weren't allowed to be piracy anymore. And so, but these people had been trained by their own governments basically to be privateers and prey like on the Spanish fish, fishing lines. So they didn't have anything else to do among other things, you know, and, um, and they were in this area that was basically unclaimed. There was, it's like, kind of was interesting thing that comes to Dallas as well. There literally was no governance there. Like it was an empty zone, you know, so it basically forced people to go out and create something. And obviously, you know, there was a mix of people who kind of fell into that milieu um, of, you know, professional pirates, so to speak. Um, but a fair number of them were basically created by this gap in governments. And then the similar thing happened in the Cold War, other things like that, basically governments wanting to disavow actions of people that they had basically sponsored. So um, and say, oh, it wasn't us. Um, and then a good portion of them too, which is really interesting, is that they were really struggling to be at the forefront of, you know, contemporary social issues. So the, the sort of system of governance in like the classic pirate ship was in some ways the purest form of democracy that has existed and certainly predates the American style democracy by like, I don't know, 80 years or more. Um, so pretty significant, um, and obviously they were maligned and all these other things, got a bad reputation for various reasons, some probably legitimate, probably some not. But, you know, what happened is in a pirate ship, for example, the crew elected the captain, and the captain 
had basically a full responsibility of how to manage the, the crew, especially in combat situations, you know, because it's a very strict hierarchy. You can't, like, step out of it, um, you know, when right. you're in a People battle. Die. You can't, like, right. question your superior's orders. You have to go through it. Anything else was basically considered mutiny um, and all of that. But then if the people, you know, not in a combat situation thought the captain wasn't doing a good job, they could basically just meet together and vote him out of office and be like, see ya, you know, you're not really a very good captain. Um, so, and, you know, a lot of things too regarding, you know, women and the inclusion of women and things like that were done very first in kind of pirate circles. And pirates, you know, were kind of more in like racial integration. I mean, all this stuff, like they were just not... They were willing to try new things that, you know, the rest of society took a good century, really, to even catch up with and, and think about. Um, and, and it was done far away from the rest of mainstream society. So when people started writing the stories, they wrote the tall tales of the pirates and all the most things that were likely to get, you know, made, like kind of the comic book version of it. So a lot of the real pirate annals, you know, are, are still... It's really interesting. It's almost like these, unknown. they... they... They had their own. Mini, I'm hearing you say they had their own sort of mini swarm intelligence, which is okay for now. You're the captain, based on the information that comes about from the last interaction or exchange we had, where you basically screwed up big time. Uh, you know, we've self-organized. We're saying sorry. You're getting demoted, and somebody else is taking the role. And it's basically between the the racial and the women. It's everyone has an opportunity to earn a, um, a spot in this in this group. And if you contribute, just like we expect people to contribute in DAOs and, and decentralized networks, you, you've got a place here. Is that roughly what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, in some ways one of the purest forms of meritocracy in that sense, because, you know, you're in a ship that has a very specific, you know, mode and you know in some ways like it says even sponsored by the government so the and then but you have you know everyone has to be working on it you can't just bring people along mm. who aren't contributing in the context of a tiny ship you know um another one <laughs> it's a really interesting side topic but you know i'm fascinated about these subjects as well sometimes it gets me into trouble but um in one of the pirate like their initiation rituals um, and there was one we kind of actually within our Burning Man camp um, kind of, you know, played with this one as an idea, but it was this like wenching ritual and it's very, very interesting. But basically the men of the pirate crew, when they were potentially basically applying to be part of the crew, had to demonstrate an act of sexual prowess. And then the woman who was kind of there would basically evaluate them publicly in front of the crew to see if they were, you know, capable enough to be a pirate, which is very interesting as well. Like, <laughs> and, and you think about like contemporary job interviews and all the different things people have done, militaries, like no one really does that, but like, maybe it's an important part. Like maybe you should have like a degree of sexual capability. You know, I, I to gotta ask, of, like, how did this some get kind deployed of crew, in you know? Burning so, Man? Like, if you're comfortable, because because I have all kinds of oh yeah, I mean, I really want to hear what you're about to say. Um, yeah, we can. It's probably Fair better enough. to talk in you know amongst pirate circles, you know, about some of these things, so to speak. So, but we do have an ongoing. Um, I, there's a book out called "Be More Pirate," and it basically applies um, pirate type thinking to kind of business consulting and stuff like that. And we've been in touch with the kind of author and them, and then as well another group of like pirate-minded people, um, you know, on the West Coast to see how this can be applied. So uh, particularly this year when Burning Man, you know, supposedly didn't happen, um, there were kind of a lot of pirates doing things, um, believe it or not. So uh, who didn't seem to need think that, that was very important, whether or not it was like officially going on. Uh, and, and and looking more broadly about you know what we can learn and apply you know. In so if you were to take the, the lessons of be more pirate systems. and and give us maybe two or three takeaways you know what what creeds or what sort of um, you know mantras would you say hey Joel I want to be more pirate in my in my thinking what what are sort of the mantras that I should be repeating to myself. Um. Well, I mean, first of all, it's all about 
art. I got gotcha. you. No, but like, but no, to have a like an artful life or whatever else. I mean, a, a colorful, interesting mm. life. Like, uh, you should be aiming for that. I guess. I mean. Don't don't allow other people to put you within their you know form of what like a Lego block looks like. I mean, unless you really like Lego blocks, I happen to like Lego blocks. But you can also use make pirate ships with Lego Lego blocks. But you know the there's a lot of things out there that basically we just to your point you have a heuristic debt about, and we're just carrying along without realizing. It. Like it, to back to our Dow conversation. So much of us have a heuristic debt around what a job looks like, what a company looks like, what a stock table looks like. I mean, you know, and in fact, a lot of the Dow stuff, like back in 2014, you know, the first white paper I wrote after the Ethereum white paper mm. was about um, reputational systems, which was actually a kind of a topical issue, big that uh, Vitalik was interested in and talked about, and then basically people stopped working on this particular issue and he kind of noted in his update like in um, last uh, December or something, like, you know, it kind of like didn't really make that much progress for reputational systems. But like, why not? Like, why are reputational currency, so to speak, or access by reputation um, potentially more interesting than fungible money that you transfer together and that everyone has? So, you know, I think in some ways, the NFT space now, and particularly if it involves like access tokens and things like that along the way, maybe kind of rediscovering some of these, you know, patterns back from 2014 and, you know, even beyond. I mean, other types of crew and, you know, initiations. And yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, um, and like all the fun full stuff. disclosure, I was uh, I served as an advisor to Dow Stack um, and Matan's whole theory, Matan Field, the uh, founder there is it's like he's like dows at scale ha rely on reputation systems it's not about voting power based on how much money you have you have to have this reputation system otherwise you don't know you know you, you can't make those decisions about who really is the best captain for that particular uh journey and i'm actually so it's interesting that you brought up nfts because i wanted to sort of pivot as we head towards our descent here and i know you've got uh you've got some appointments later so we want to respect your time but Let's talk about NFTs, and then I want to close out with MetaMask because that's the question everyone's going to ask. We'll, we'll hold that to the end. But, you know, have you been surprised by how quickly the NFT thing's blown up? Or you sort of, you know, like, what's your reaction as you see this just, you know, it's in every mainstream publication now. H how are you reacting? Do you think it's just, you know, is it hype cycle? Is it hype cycle and here to stay? Is it we're just at the beginning and we're not even hitting a hype cycle? How are you responding to what's going on right now? I think it's totally nuts, but it's mostly good in the sense that, you know, people like myself have been writing about NFTs and trying to figure out valuation criteria and DAOs and NFTs for, you know, at least a year or more. And then the fact that everyone cares about them means that some of these things are starting to get developed and it's a lot easier to convince people to finance projects around these things and, you know, go through that whole process. So, um, I, and I think realistically, you know, market cap around NFTs could go five to 10 X of what ICOs were. I mean, there's so many good application areas for this type of technology that, you know, right. even goes into like the broader tokenization, like you're tokenizing things, but you know, there's a bunch of models that still haven't really been tried or deployed in the wild. And, um, you know, are really interesting. So I think maybe the digital art bubble at the moment may dissipate, you know, and certain things will kind of pop. I mean, uh, will crypto punks hold their value? I don't know for sure, um, you know, but the broader thing, I think, you know, you probably see, you know, one of these just massive, you know, uh, bubble type things and then it will, Pop and then we'll you know, the, good stuff we'll will see be the Jeffrey Moore over, chasm and, and the Carlotta Perez installation and that'll just years, keep so. playing out as we go in. And then you know NFTs to me and gaming is just what, what you think yeah. art is big. Yeah. Wait till we get to all the video gamers out there. I mean that's going to be ridiculous. But um, wow, this is I feel like I could talk to you for yeah. You know, and I you know I've been playing with that quite a bit because I just I don't think I don't think that our um, 
current blockchain right. infrastructure can support like any of the type of like you know explosion right. and NFTs that is going to happening right now. So I think we're going to have to see like a whole new flourishing of you know blockchain related thing to support that as well. So that's one of the big things I'm involved in right now is the kind of research phase of what it takes to do blockchain like you know, like serious layer one scalability NFT specifically. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, back to layer one again, but like with instead of like pursuing it as an intellectual problem, you know, pursuing it as like a necessity behind you know, a specific kind this of This might get me in trouble with you or the audience, but what the that. heck. So, you know, I, I'm a, 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 my 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 technology career goes all the way back to the mid 80s when I got my first Mac. Even before that, I have like this Sony thing, but you know, I think about Internet 1.0 and, you, you you know, as exciting it was to use the earliest, you know, mosaic web browser and things like that. And you saw these first iterations of new possibilities, whether it was Netscape or AOL or CompuServe and Prodigy before that. So there are days where I look at this and I say, wow, Ethereum is amazing. But what if it's like the CompuServe Prodigy of its era because it ha it's not able to solve that scaling? On the other side, I say, well, what's different here is obviously there's a ton of sk actual skin in the game, a lot of research going on to it. And I don't want you to say, oh, yes, it will make it or won't make it. But the fact that we've seen this series proof, you know, proofs of concept, if you will, around DeFi, around NFTs, we know it's working. And now you have to go back to that layer one research and say, well, either how do we do it with the existing system or is there a need for different types of specialized blockchain just for NFTs, just for DeFi, and then have that interoperability. So, you know, I'm not necessarily asking you for a comment. I'll definitely take one, but I'd be interested in sort of what your research is starting to uncover as you think about what will be the characteristics of the layer ones that ultimately, based on your hypothesis, will be successful to support the kind of scale that we think is most likely, if that makes sense. I'm not sure about this, so this is like kind of hypothetical in some ways, but I think um, there's a good chance that it will be mm -hmm. more of a step up function than an incremental innovation, you know? And I think that there are some system architectures out there that, uh, you know, are arguably better, you know, at scale that don't come out of the, let's say, mm -hmm. iterative version from like a more purist decentralization model. Obviously, for right. everyone who is like a more purist around those things, they're always unsettled by some of these other sort of network topologies. But, um, you know, at, but there's more choices than, you know, right. having all of your money stored on someone else's bank server and then, you know, decentralization in, in the kind of fullest sense of that. So, you know, there's federated models. There's really a lot of other stuff. That's yeah, out there. yeah. Well, I guess the last question I want to ask you before we uh, wrap up, and we didn't even touch on Holonic philosophy, which I'm going to have to Google unless you can give me the one sentence explanation on that one. Um, but uh, go, I'm ready. Go. I'll, I'll give you the one sentence one. For sure. So the most basic version of it, I mean, it comes from Arthur Kostler and many things looking at biological systems and all that. But what it is, is basically saying we, for our evaluative mechanism of the health or prospect of anything, um, we don't want to use anything that is not, that is an external evaluation. So basically if we're looking at the health of cellular life or an individual, we want to do something that is based on mm. the statistics of the system. So, and I think we can do that kind of from a bottom up approach, but the, to the extent to which we can do it and we can remove these sort of external Correct. taxonomies, like saying like, did God say this is good? You know, would be like one classic one, you know? And then how did God say it was good? Well, it's in this book and blah, blah, blah. You know, that's like a, that's not a holonic way of evaluating things. Well, that, um, it, 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 that sounds like a little so, bit yeah, what anyways, you're that's describing a, that's about with Dubai version. and smart so cities then because you know, Dubai is saying, we're not going to just let somebody say, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a wave in Europe and we got to just shut everything down because we need, it's like, no, we're seeing what's happening in the gyms and the, and the data and the, and the beaches and blah, blah, blah. And based on that, what's happening in the Dubai system, if you will, we're making decisions. Is that 
I mean, am I connecting the dots accurately? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely the direction, you know, that all the stuff needs to go in, you know, and and it basically comes down to the purity of your data. If you let other people define, you know, the categories for you, even the most individual thing, you know, yeah. if you let other people decide what makes you yeah, happy. That's true. Not that's that not happy. living the, pri the, the pirate lifestyle by, by you know? any stretch. Yeah. You're, you're, you're being a pirate with all these definitely, filters you've been throwing at us throughout pirate, this call. So I, I love that you're, you're demoing you know, in real time. All right, Joel, last question I, I got to ask, MetaMask. I mean, first of all, seriously, and, and I mean this, I, I'm grateful to you for having done what you did because it's one of those things where once you experience the MetaMask UX and the single sign-on and all that, you're just like, oh my God, the other system is so stupid. So, you know, you opened up a whole realm of possibility for people who are sort of at that next layer of technical capability. So. Seriously, man, thank you for your contribution. But I got to ask you, when you look back at the way you built it, what are the things that you're now sort of kicking yourself? Like, oh, I wish I'd thought of X or Y, or I would have done this differently, or maybe there's nothing, but I'm just curious. Well, yeah, just to go back to the beginning, I mean, it was maybe my idea or other people's idea, DevCon Zero was the one who kind of got its initial momentum. But I wrote like basically zero of the code that is MetaMask, and the lion's share of the effort was borne by you know Fair enough. engineers Fair. that were in the trenches, and so I would not like to take credit away from them, despite you know having you know pushed it forward and recognized there was a need, and you know got its initial funding and some other things. So, um, but yeah, I, I think you know it can always be better, and I think one of the things that that's I guess maybe drives me is just making things better. I don't know. Um, and so I think there's still a lot of opportunity. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that it exists. I think I generally feel extremely positive about the fact and how it's developed and, you know, the, the reach it has and, you know, enabling all this stuff. And it was super clear that we needed that kind of bridge development within the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, you know, an original conception was actually supposed to be a community-owned project, which interestingly back tokenization community ownership. That was part of the licensing that was in the original version. Um, so that, I, mean, I think that could be really interesting as an evolution. Um, another evolution, you know, is really just kind of going back into, you know, what is a kind of most clean UX that kind of really reaches out into the mainstream and integrates with the social media universe. Because, right. you know, there's other people that are, you know, stuck inside Facebook and some version of Facebook's app and stuff like that. And obviously they're trying to, you know, force feed everyone like their version of a cryptocurrency, which they're calling the cryptocurrency because they hope they can get around the regulation. Um, but they don't really care about cryptocurrency. I think everyone should realize that. So who has at least a tiny bit of intelligence. So, um, yeah, so like what are we doing, you know, around yeah. those topics and kind of really reaching that? I think it's still a real question, you know, and I think it's, you know, I think the, the NFT and engaging artists is really exciting. Those people, and I've been in a bunch of rooms recently where people are like discovering and talking about MetaMask for like the first time and talking about how it works. And it's actually very gratifying mm. for me to be someone just kind of lurking almost in these rooms where people are discussing something that uh, you sort of found it. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes they don't even give you a chance to speak, which is maybe less gratifying. But, um, uh, you know, still, it's like, it's cool to see their discovery process, but it also makes me realize, you know, the work that is to be done around these things, particularly, you know, if you wanted to go beyond like an early adopter, digital visionary artist people mm. into like a registry for all digital art, you know, and the licensing that would have to happen. Like, I don't know if you know, um, I love Trent, Trent He's one who of the actually best. worked with Vitalik. He's now doing ocean protocol, but that was like, when somebody's his, oh yeah. Trent is incredible, right? So and that was kind of original thing that he was doing with the scribe way before Ocean Protocol. Right, is like, how can we right. do a digital registry of assets on a blockchain that then potentially includes the licensing, includes the revenue stream distribution, and all those things that you can theoretically do. You've been able to do them theoretically, but we still haven't gotten the technology to that point. Um, and you know, that, I guess I, was, I still feel like we're you know, another five, 10 years from having some of these things built, we'll go through some other giant hype right. cycle. It'll probably partially implode. People will be like, oh, those NFTs were stupid. And then something will actually get built. And then, you know, at some point, 
hopefully we'll have that you know version of it but it may not be yeah, I, mean, it may not be with would, the I mean i could have a whole you know, call may. just on trent and you know data tokens and, and and he had an amazing post about two years ago i think it was called nature 2.0 so it comes back to the sustainability and how we start making nature part of the dow of dows you know and, and trees having their own sort of governance token, if you will. So, you know, there's a lot of things. I mean, I think it goes back to your earliest days as well with some of these uh, putting trees and, and the trust as it were um, on the on the blockchain. There's a really interesting project down in Brazil called Moss.Earth where they're tokenizing carbon credits and sort of doing that. So there's a lot of really interesting uh, experiments in that, but we could spend all day on that. But Listen, man, this has been amazing. I'm really, really grateful for you taking out the time uh, to, to chat with us. I know you've got a busy schedule and, uh, you know, the Singularity Net community is obviously grateful for it as well. If people are interested in following your thought patterns or, or you know, staying connected in some way to what you're doing, do you have any, any place where they should go? Is it a Twitter? Is it Clubhouse? Is it some decentralized network I've never heard of? What should we be doing if we want more of Joel? You can follow me on Twitter. I mean, most of the NFT projects I'm, talk I'm working on right now, I can't talk about, but Fair when enough. I can, so probably find out pretty easily. <laughs> um, and yeah, there is definitely a good yep. reason for having a more decentralized version of Clubhouse right now. Uh, so right. if awesome. you're interested well, Joel, in Joel, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for making all the time. And um, you know, best of luck in continuing to, to fight the battles of bringing the decentralized world to the present uh, quickly as possible. So continued success, sir. Thank well, you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy, for your time and uh, my best to all, all right. of your listeners. So.